The World Health Organization is now officially endorsing the use of steroids to treat the most seriously ill of COVID-19 patients. This is the first official guidance on treatment from the WHO. Following randomized controlled trials, we've been reporting on the results of these, that show steroids reduce the risk of death in the first month considerably in the most ill of patients. So there's a lot of talk about these drugs, how they are cheap, widely available, have a long safety record. And this is why some people are so excited with this announcement and this research. It's a great starting point for our conversation this morning with Dr. Susie Hoda, who's the Medical Director of Infection Prevention and Control at the University Health Network. She's in Toronto this morning. And Dr. Hoda, welcome to our program. Good morning. Can we begin with this research because it was published just yesterday in the Journal of American Medical Association of the Association of Medical JAMA. Let's just go with JAMA. It's published in clinical trials that have been uh, verified and published yesterday. We talked a lot about dexamethasone back in June when that research came out about that story, but it's more than just the one now. We're talking about multiple types of these drugs which seem to be having good results. What did you find in the research that stands out for you? Well, first of all, I think it's some very well composited news during a pandemic that's been full of a lot of negative news. Um, so, you know, to see that we now have growing evidence uh, that really shows that steroids, which are drugs that we have a lot of familiarity and experience with clinically, um, and not just one particular type of steroid, but it appears like as though it's a class effect uh, because hydrocortisone, another steroid, also showed some mortality benefit in these studies are potentially going to be life-saving for patients with severe or critical illness with COVID-19 is, is really quite helpful. Um, so I, uh, I thought that this was really interesting news. Um, I think people are looking for a silver bullet as something new that might change the landscape of how we manage um, COVID-19 infections. And here we have something that, uh, you know, is something commonly used already in clinical practice that might be helpful. You know, it's readily available to a lot of um, people and a lot of healthcare facilities, and it's cheap, and so that makes it accessible. And these are all positive things about, yes. about this potential treatment. I was struck by one of the statements from one of the research involved in these studies who said it's the best news, I think, that we've had in this pandemic so far, which was going far, I thought, in terms of classifying this research. But in endorsing this, the WHO, I mean, the thinking, Dr. Hoda, is this could become instantly usable in clinical practice, become the standard of care. So is this the kind of thing that we could expect to see in Canada? Absolutely. In fact, steroids, dexamethasone, did become uh, standard of care after the initial trial was released in June in many areas uh, within the world. And so I think this just gives us more confidence with it. Um, as well, I mean, I think we all recognize that we need to learn a little bit more. There's still some unanswered questions about dosing and, uh, you know, when to apply the treatment exactly in the course of illness and, and other outstanding questions that we'll hopefully be able to answer over time. Something that's come out of the States in the last few hours, Dr. Hoda, that I think is worrying many people, and I'd be interested in your thoughts on it. The CDC has told health authorities in all 50 of the United States to be ready to distribute a vaccine by November the 1st. People keep coming back to the fact that November 3rd is the election day in the United States. But to have a vaccine ready to use in high-risk groups, and this would be ready to go even before all of those critical stage three clinical trials would be completed, one would assume. What do you make of this guidance? I mean, that worries me considerably. I, I think that's a very ambitious timeline to be talking about rolling out potentially a vaccine in two months from now. I mean, I think there's no harm in being ready and prepared and thinking about distribution of vaccine because that takes some effort and time, you know, like how to, how to roll it out to masses of people. But, you know, we need to absolutely be sure that we're dealing with vaccines that are, you know, safe and effective before we start giving them to people. And that's why it's so important to have the multiple phases of trials with thousands and thousands of people to get that kind of confidence and that information. So I, I really hope it's not going to be jumping the gun. I, I think it was interesting. I've heard health officials point out that if the results were overwhelming, either positive or negative, they could bring a vaccine online. Obviously, that would be if it were positive, overwhelmingly so, before clinical trials are completed. But because we're giving vaccines to healthy people, I mean, potentially this could do more harm than good, couldn't it? 
safety is always a, a key consideration, right? I mean, I, I think that phase three trials where you have tens of thousands of people across the world in different parts of the world um, receiving vaccines give you a lot of information on the safety parameters and profile of, of different drugs and vaccines. Um, so, you know, I do think that that's really an important uh, consideration and I would, I would be uh, nervous if I saw uh, that people were not actually following what regulatory bodies have required up until this point to really release something um, to the public. People are nervous in the state that this may be a case of political interference, so we're certainly watching that part of the story. I would like to ask you finally one aspect of our overall health, Dr. Hoda, that has not received a whole lot of public attention during the pandemic is our sexual health. But that changed yesterday when Dr. Theresa Tam, who heads the Public Health Agency of Canada, issued a statement. And here are some of what she had to say. She said it, how complicated the whole matter of sex is in the time of COVID-19. So she issued some recommendations, avoiding face-to-face -face contact or closeness, skipping kissing, considering wearing a mask. And this is especially true in her view with new sexual partners. Could you just uh, talk about the importance of releasing this type of information? As I said, it's not something we've talked about a whole lot. Right. I mean, I think, I mean, it's it's an important thing to talk about, like you said, because I think it's been neglected and, and people are wondering, what what can I do here? And, and I think it's also important to really focus on that last statement that she made about particularly with new sexual contacts, because that's where there's a lot more uncertainty as to what the exposure risks are. I think for people who have been in long-term relationships where essentially their partners are within their social bubble, uh, it's less important to be thinking about these things. So my thoughts are really from a scientific and public health perspective. Yes, it makes sense to be recommending that people wear uh, masks during sexual intercourse. From the perspective of a human being, I think it's going to be really difficult for people mm -hmm. to do that because it, it takes away the intimacy that everyone's craving so much during time when we're so separated from one another and, and frankly divided from one another. So I think it's going to be really tough for people to, to hold on to that. Do you think this might be directed? I mean, we know the numbers are, are really increasing within Canadians under the age of 40. So this might be helpful guidance to that young demographic that health officials are quite concerned about right now. Yes, I mean, I think they're trying to consider all aspects of how people are interacting, especially young people, that might be contributing to those increases. So, you know, I think it's good that it's being addressed, that we're talking about it head on and not trying to avoid a topic that might be uncomfortable for some people to talk about. Um, but, you know, recommendations around it are really difficult because of the nature of what we're talking about. Abstinence is best, she says, but with the pandemic, everything is complicated, Dr. Hoda. Thanks a lot. Really appreciate your joining us this morning, as always, Dr. Susie Hoda.